And we are live, Cloud Foundry After Dark. We're already starting out with a full house. So much happened. So much is going to happen. Who wants to talk about something? How about that Sam Ramsey guy? Who's got something to say? Where's Waters? I see he's on mute. And frozen. He's trying to talk. I, I love Sam. Um, I, I got a chance to work with him for a few weeks before the uh, announcement got uh, publicized and uh, announced officially. And man, he's an animal. He's really excited. He's uh, he's got like a lot of energy, a lot of ideas. And then some of the the people he has on his team, uh, Chip has been announced so far. Um, he's also really uh, a go getter. I'm I'm really enthusiastic about having this uh, foundation really kick off and dedicated employees and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun. Uh, I can see the other, um, not just uh, um, you know, other, other people in the ecosystem have been really excited about that too. I've seen Sam already traveling around and meeting with people from, from IBM and other places so it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I'm really stoked how professional and just uh, driven the Linux Foundation people are. They really don't have any they don't, they don't have any, you know, skin in the game or any outcome. They're just uh, trying to do these things. For the, we're we're planning this Cloud Foundry Summit, and they're doing a ton of events all over the place. But they they're definitely focused on making it an awesome event. Did, did James manage to make it into the hangout? Yo, can you hear me? We can, but yeah, there we are. You know. It was so hard for me to keep the Romsey news quiet for three whole months while we were planning it. And uh, I got to say, just the back channel with him since he started, it's been incredible. Like, so many of his friends have come out of the woodwork be like, hey, I was curious about Cloud Foundry, but now that you're doing it, you know, maybe you could help me understand this. And uh, I think he just did so much great work in the API stuff for Apogee and helping people build you know, digital platforms at Apogee that he's going to just hit the ground running in a huge way for us, so. Let's not forget what he did at Microsoft. Right. The, all the open source work he did there, that's... No, that's what I mean. You, you take yeah. someone who's great at open source in a complex environment and then someone who really understands HTTP-driven applications. And I'm like, how do you even dream that up to run Cloud Foundry, you know, foundation? Like, to me, that's just a... That's amazing. So I was trying to coax him to come on tonight, and he said he would have, but he's having a late Valentine's date. So we'll, we'll try to get Sam on here next week or uh, really soon, either way. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, just stay tuned. I think the, the cool thing is the Linux Foundation, I'm sorry, the Cloud Foundry Foundation and partnership with Linux Foundation is like its own full-fledged machine now, and uh, they're out there forming a Wall Street working group, which is going to be incredible. They're forming an IoT working group, and they've already got the hugest names in IoT. So we've got the biggest names in Wall Street, top five financial institutions in the world, most of them represented. We've got um, the biggest names in like big industrial manufacturers that care about IoT and industrial internet already in the working group and the foundation. So uh, underestimate it at your peril, the impact it's going to have. Yeah, I'm excited. I just want to build some cloud stuff. <laughs> what else is going on? Well, I'm really excited. We have uh, Greg from the uh, Spring Engineering team tonight uh, to give us a little update, break a little secret. It was really hilarious. He's like, hey, I got some secret sauce. Can I come on the uh, After Dark and uh, and make a little secret news? So I think that's yeah, become like our trademark. We reward people for giving up their Sunday night with a little insider info. <laughs> it was only possible because I was able because over here it's late enough that everybody's already asleep. <laughs> but uh, uh, Brian DeSo, our uh, spring team manager, whatever, uh, recruited me uh, a few weeks ago to work on an integration module, a Cloud Foundry plugin, with a uh, certain other company that we've been doing a lot of OSS work with. Um, so I wasn't going to reveal their name yet because their the announcement's coming out in March about open sourcing this, but uh, they have a a big mega continuous integration CI solution, whatever they're working on, that has a lot of complex orchestration. And the question was, can we build a hook to Cloud Foundry? This is a 
somebody that has to go push out like when they when they uh, commit to master and push out a new version of, of their artifacts, they need to deploy it to like ten thousand machines or virtual locations. Now they use Amazon Web Services, but who's to say people big shops aren't going to want to deploy to multiple cloud foundry instances and stuff like that? Do they do they happen to stream video and take like a third of the internet traffic at any point in the? I've, I've yeah. heard that rumor to be true. <laughs> <laughs> In a completely unrelated uh, topic, I think very few people understand how much uh, Netflix uses Spring Technology and Spring Boot um, and uh, how close those two teams are lately. So I think that's, that's another opportunity for collaboration that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm so excited about the Spring team being more of an architectural guidance and feedback loop on the Cloud Foundry platform is... There's so many demanding use cases for Spring out there right now and, and big applications. This sounds like another great example of that. Yeah, the uh, the guy I talked with originally working on this actually isn't at Netflix anymore, but we managed to keep going at it. And they have this you know incredibly complex rollout procedure. Like if they ro roll out a new artifact, they're not going to push it to the east coast of the United States at 7 p.m. at night, for instance, you know, during prime time. Yeah, uh, they they need a more complex orchestration engine to roll it out properly to different things, and there's just nothing out there. Can you go pull it off the shelf and do that? Um, so how hard was it to add CF support for this? Well, it was. It turned out to really really be pretty easy. It's really just kind of gluing stuff together. They've the word I understand is they probably migrated it, like about half their software code over to Spring Boot. So the system that they have, it's a Spring Boot. Uh, th it's a Spring Boot app or a collection of modules in here, uh, so they're leveraging all the power of Spring Boot. So I was able to walk in and do it really easily because uh, I was quite familiar with Spring Boot. And then it was basically I needed to look up the code to the Cloud Foundry Maven plugin to see what the flow of what's how do you programmatically do a, a CF push. And so it took me about two weeks of coding. And the, the other thing is this app's totally written in Groovy, so. The uh, overhead was slimmed way down on what I had to write. Excellent. I got to actually have a running demo. I can I do a little screen share. I can show it. You can take the screen by going on the left side and clicking on the thing. It's sort of a green arrow looking. The screen share and hover. There you go. There you go. All right. Now what I have here is, uh, I don't know how readable that is on your end, my nice green on black. If you make the font bigger, it might be nicer. That's right. Or not, I don't know. Well, I made it bigger and the whole window just got bigger. We'll make it work. That's pretty clear for me. Okay. Well, over here in one, sh over here on this this panel, I've got the the web app running here. That basically what it does is uh, let me show you a uh, what we're talking about doing. Um, you basically send it a JSON document in this format, and it says, "Hey, this is a Cloud Foundry deploy description." And it's got the the basics of you know you've got your jar your artifact. In this case, it's a little Spring Boot demo app that I, I have slapped together the name of the app that it's going to be on at Cloud Foundry, and it's got the, the uh, Cloud Foundry coordinates, the API org and space, and in this case I said it's five instances. Now it says credentials, that basically says go look into your system and find the, that name and go dig up his credentials. So when I launched the, that web app earlier, uh, I plugged in my Cloud Foundry credentials to PDubs. Basically, use the magic of curl here. So I got feedback on the last episode that people don't know our jargon, so when we say PDubs, they didn't know what we meant. Oh. So while he's typing, someone explain what PDubs is. PDubs is 875 Howard slang for Pivotal Web Services. So it's a, it's a platform as a service that you can go sign up for and try. As it's a hosted, uh, hosted multi-tenant Cloud Foundry. And let's make totally clear, 875 Howard is the pivotal office in San Francisco. 
Just so that we clarify the slang all the way down. I always make sure to wrap my jargon in jargon, man. That's I'll right. I'll this jargon it. sandwich. It's like bacon wrapped bacon. There's Acronym, nothing more accurate than bacon wrapped bacon. All right, so back to Greg. Wait, you're right. about to cur curl this thing here. Okay, I'm going to curl it. I'm going to ship it over. Just one little check. Okay, I think it looks good. And it threw back at me basically a URI where I can monitor it from a remotely I can monitor what's happening, but I'm going to flip back to what's happening on the website, and um, it's uh, it's actually doing a deploy. Um, it looks through, it actually, because it supports multiple deployment options like Docker, AWS, Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, it's basically doing a, a push operation here, and this is the part whenever I do a screencast, I kind of jabber a while because it takes about a minute to do a deploy operation and try to fill the space. <laughs> Are there are there different deployment strategies like uh, red black or you know one region then another region like how complex do you think the deployment strategies are from what you've seen here? Well, what they have uh, basically my the blue plate blue the sorry the blueprint that I used to uh, put this together was I, I looked at their Amazon deploy description and they have an option to plug in like an array of regions to send it to. Like U.S. East Coast one, U.S. East Coast two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I didn't quite take it that route. I just, I just made it. I was going for minimum viable product here. Yeah. Uh, to send it to one target, and the whole JSON structure that it accepts is an array. So in that one document that I piped over, I could have listed multiple targets. I smell orchestration for deploying to multiple cloud foundries. That's why I got so excited when I first saw the demo of this and I wanted us to apply resources to make sure we contributed to it because I have a personal intellectual curiosity of what I call the God layer, which is people always want Cloud Foundry to do everything, and I'm always like, well, there actually might be something that tells some Cloud Foundries what to do sometimes. What does that layer look so like? So can, can I freak you out in this conversation? Because I as soon I as had the Wi-Fi with a bunch of different customers. Uh, am, I, am I choppy? You were a little choppy there up in Canada, eh? Yeah, well, no, it's just because I'm in the wrong room. The Wi-Fi is strong in the other room right next to where my kids are asleep. So Sorry. I'm in the back room where there's no Wi-Fi. Wi um, is this no, after just gonna, dark in your bathroom? This is after dark in my home office, which does not have good Wi-Fi. Okay, I thought you it's said bathroom, not back room. Back, <laughs> back room. Yes. I'm in the toilet. I'm in, I'm in the bathtub right now with my whiskey and it's my laptop. No, it's not that late on the list. This is what Pivotal has reduced you to. No, so, um, no, what's, what Pivotal has reduced me to is talking to people about Tosca. Um, that is which, terrible. Which terrible came, fate. Came up a number of times in the last week, but I finally understood why people keep bringing it up. And they're like, well, you know, what I want to do is, like, push a couple of different apps at the same time to a couple of different places. I was like, damn, we can do that. That's not, don't go to Tosca. Like, you don't have to go full nuclear to achieve this. Did you guys see we have a new um, CLI plugin that does this now? It's called CF Plugin Seed. Somebody in the community built this thing. Um, and it's kind of cool. It's just like push, set up some orgs and spaces and push a bunch of apps and set up some services and bind them to those apps as a little YAML snippet. Um, which starts to feel like what you just did. So uh, I'm, I guess I'm asking, is that sort of like what you just did, except slightly more arbitrary or more extensible or using yeah. some groovy? You know, on the surface, when you look at this, it's like, well, what's the big difference between this and just using the CF Maven plugin or the CF Gradle plugin? And the whole idea is this takes the same flow and backs it into their mega orchestration CI engine. Um, the guy that's reviewing my pull request now to accept this is talking about that they, they have some other modules that are involved with actually monitoring the outcome and, and stuff like that. So that may be what I commonly call that will be phase two to expand the support into their CI systems so they can have more sophisticated orchestration. Um, but uh, I, mean, I, I tend to go to the same place and say, you know, you should really do complicated things with the CI because the CI can be parent to your Cloud Foundry environments, and maybe services that are running in OpenStack or services that are running in dedicated old-school infrastructure. But then uh, we have customers saying, well, you know what, I really want is something that feels like it's part of the Cloud Foundry workflow, but but can do more, do a little bit more. So, so Greg, just to clarify, and maybe you, tr you start explaining this, what is this built for? Who's going to use it? 
how is it going to evolve? Well, here's here's who it's for. Basically, are you you know are you a big shop that has a more a, a complex deploy solution? In other words, Netflix isn't going to use this because right now Netflix is using AWS. Well, someday maybe they will use CF, but you know six months from now probably not. But they also have module support for like Google Compute Engine, GCE, uh, Docker images, um, some other stuff in there. So. You know, when we talk about bringing, like, uh, what is it, um, consumer-grade software choices to the enterprise, um, I think the fact that they plan to open source this whole orchestration CI solution in the next month, I think it opens opportunities when people are like, well, we're a Cloud Foundry shop, but, you know, if they didn't have this module support, they'd, you know, turn their nose at this and look elsewhere if they had something complex. But the fact that we have support opens a door. I, I Okay, so this is Cloud Foundry support in the context of this CI orchestration tool. Exactly. Got it. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's other stuff going on that's not exactly like this, but in one of our Wall Street build-outs right now, uh, my good friend uh, Duncan uh, Johnson-Watt uh, and his uh, Apache Brooklyn team have been working to overlay, you know, multiple cloud foundries and to have app deployment that is potentially more complex than just things running in Cloud Foundry alone. And, you know, my point in these kind of conversations is, is that um, you really you get the benefit that CF provides and that it's a very simple endpoint that you access. So you don't have to know anything much about the app environment when it lands, just some basic parameters. Um, but you can still orchestrate across multiple things. And so kind of the dumber you make those upper-level tools, potentially, um, the better, as opposed to them having to set up the entire app environment, load balancers, and all the other cruft uh, would make it pretty pretty difficult. So um, I think I was talking to Duncan about putting that work into the Cloud Foundry community run by uh, uh, Nick Williams today. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. So we got a couple things cooking uh, on this front. Looks like we. Looks like it works. Yeah, it worked. I got it. You know, let me see here. They. This is just my little toy app that I have. This is a little management app that I have to go keep an eyeball on all the uh, spring guides that we have. Um, so I just use this as my sample demo copy here. Um, but you know, and something else, I'm gonna. The call for papers is open now for the uh, spring I spring conference at the uh, later this year. And I'm going to try to hit up my uh, Netflix contact to see if he wants to do a presentation on this at, at Spring 1. Um, the fact that I saw what it took to spec out an AWS deployment, it is a mammoth document of all the fields and load balancers and the, just the complexity of that thing. And I was like, man, ditch that. Go to Cloud Foundry. It's a lot simpler. <laughs> That's what I was just saying, right? Like, yeah. us, sort of like you, you pass a couple parameters and you walk away. Well, to be fair, all that stuff's buried underneath in your... Bosch deploy, right? Well, but, but people deploying apps don't know that, right? I mean, it's just like True. They're, not, they're not putting RAM in the servers when they use Amazon. It's just levels of abstraction. So did I get that right a minute ago? You were saying they're using uh, Apache Brooklyn stuff to uh, coordinate Cloud Foundry stuff? Yeah, so uh, Duncan and uh, crew at CloudSoft... Um, you know, for legacy applications or things that might span things outside of Cloud Foundry, they wanted kind of one layer that they could ask to go do things on their behalf. So, I mean, as many services as we're going to have, we're never going to have them all, and there's always going to be something that's outside of us, I think, by definition. And I think any system like ours, that's going to be definitional. Um, so this particular financial services company wanted to use Apache Brooklyn as an overlay um, to map out meta applications and potentially orchestration on top of CF, and they're going to open source that. So I think I'm really interested in over time of how high up we should go in enabling this and making it simple, um, but I think there's always going to be room for uh, a layer that coordinates between multiple uh, multiple environments and you know apps outside of this. And Greg, one other thing would be interesting, we're adding this asynchronous services API to CF, right? I think one people one thing people ask us is like, I want to go create a service during my deploy and know that I have that service by the time my app deploys. That would be an extra bit of logic we'd have to think through. I think the the non immediate synchronous service deployment. Right. Yeah. 
Maybe we walk through a use case real quick, Greg, on how we could apply this to really maximize the value of Cloud Foundry. Okay. Um, well, I guess the logical example I've thought about is, um, you know, I look at I look at the situation like you're a streaming video company, and you have you have to be sensitive to when you do deploys. One of their one of their use cases is is that. Uh, when they do certain deploys, they need to reset caches. That is something they said they will require a human intervention to approve a cache reset. Uh, so despite whatever automation you do, do not reset the caches unless it's been approved you know, here and now. And so that's something they're trying to insert into the flow of all this stuff. Um, but uh, essentially you say, you know, well, we need to roll this out. Uh, you know, we have a new release. Somebody's just made a, an update to, to the system, and you have different regions. I can imagine that you could regionalize if you're running Cloud Foundry on top of the AWS various zones or regions, whatever they call it. Um, each of those would have a different API destination. So I, what I'm not totally spun up on yet is what their orchestration engine looks like, like how they do all the scheduling, for instance. I think they use Jenkins to generate the original artifact, and the idea is to send it out to all the different uh, target locations. So they may schedule through their orchestration engine to send it to the West Coast, and then send it to the East Coast at a different time, which could be a different Cloud Foundry endpoint, and then send it out to the Eurozone, and then send it out to Eastern Asia at, at another time, and these could all be different zone regions that are each running different Cloud Foundry instances. And so each one would have a slightly different uh, uh, document that it has to kick off like that. Yeah, that cache, that cache one is really interesting, right? Because that's when you start to get into thinking about truly live production services. You're not just updating. Like, it's not just a version push and switching the router. Like, you're, you're, you're thinking about the full life cycle end-to-end. Um, -end. Turns out it's the state that's hard. Well, we actually have, you know, we have some uh, runtime experience in, in that situation. The uh, Spring.io website runs on four nodes, four, four instances inside a Cloud Foundry app. And um, I saw uh, Brian Clozell's presentation at last year's Spring 1 that uh, one of the biggest costs that that app does is it keeps regenerating the caches for the getting started guides, like, periodically, even if there's been no update. Like the cache on a guide will expire and it regenerates it and it doesn't necessarily have to. So one thing we would run into is we would update a guide and one of the caches would be up to date and the other would not be. So some people would see the update and some people would not. And it was also doing unnecessary amounts of work. So one thing he implemented was to pull that caching out of those four instances and move it into Redis. So you have a single highly fault tolerant caching solution so that everybody gets the update. And that's step one. And step two is, is um, we've talked about putting in a hook so that if somebody updates the guide on GitHub, it could do a RESTful call back to the Spring.io site and say, regenerate this guide's cache now. And it does it potentially when nobody's looking at it, and it doesn't have to keep redoing it constantly if there's been no changes, only respond to when changes have happened. And so when you go to other shops and they're talking about, you know, we need some sophisticated cash management, you know, we've got a reference application, the Spring I.O. Sagan app, that's doing that kind of stuff. So how, how granular can you, is it all or nothing to regenerate the manual, or can you just do, like, one page? Well, the, what I'm talking about is a one-page guide. Oh, it's one page already, so. This is what these, these guides are, so I'm just picking one example of what we've done with that. So, you know... Once you start getting into, like, I guess that's app-level data and stuff you're dealing with, and it's like, uh, you know, you have to, everyone, you have to solve it a little bit differently, but, you know, we've already been there to some degree to deal with that, so. So I want, I want to go back to something Waters has said that's sort of related, and that's this notion of, of order, order mattering in, in some of the orchestration, and... I, I know why people want to do that, but it's kind of a bad idea. Or, or it's potentially... Are you, are you making an item potency assertion here, Andrew? It's not about item potency. It's actually about failure characteristics because the, the things that you have to do in a weird order to get set up, 
you have to you have to figure out what the hell's going on when something goes wrong to get back into a working state in a production system. So there's a bunch I, of I disagree and I agree. I think you're highlighting a legitimate concern where people trivialize state and they trivialize state as if it's Boolean. You're either in this state or you're not in that state. But if you've done game programming and you think about state and state transitions and think about like tweening when you're doing animation, order matters because every transition from one state to another is essentially an ordered operation. And you have state, you have possible transitions between different states that only exist given the state that you're in. Right? So this is why I always come back to saying, hey, we should treat that we should talk about this as what's narrow AI it is. But that, that's, a function, that's a function of how you're framing your order. I mean, let's look at the simplest case. Right? Let's Well, let's look at Hystrix in the in the context of, of failure modes. You know, circuits are not either open or closed. They're either and, and your order of operations is you can't go from open to closed, open to half open to closed, right? That's that that state transition matters because you're ignoring the sense that the system is semi recovered for a period of time. Same thing with a rate array. An underlying rate array doesn't go from being degraded to good. It goes from being degraded to recovering to good. And recovering takes a fixed amount of time and has a series of operations. So I think cl claiming that those kinds of state transitions don't happen at the app level or the... So I'm not saying... That magic Peter peanut butter over top. Or that those things don't do, go into different states in a different order. But if you built into your deployment the necessity for certain things to be up or not up, then you have to go back and unravel that in the case where you've had a failure. And it's much easier, and it's, I think, a much more enlightened approach to this to build, one, uh, graceful degradation into your applications, and two, take advantage of that to not depend on time, but just wait until those services are available and then reconnect to them using something like you were mentioning with the uh, districts or, or whatever, like some sort of uh, circuit breaker. I, I agree you want to you minimize the number of places where you're dealing with order sensitive operations and probably centralize those into a fairly intelligent distributed systems controller. I just don't think the design of distributed systems Josh's Wi-Fi is killing me. Josh, you're losing 90 IQ points. <laughs> we, we have, we have ordered... Have, uh, I don't have a lot to spare, okay, but I don't think you can... Tweet that, man. <laughs> we can't actually hear you. Josh, sorry, man. We, okay, I'll reply. We, on, we on love Twitter. you. Try, try, try again. <laughs> so where were we? Well, I'm excited to see how Greg's work continues on this, and I think we can we can always learn more from some of these mega scale web companies about how they really think about it. And one thing I'm curious about is if we ever get any canary deployment logic in something like this, or where the canary logic lives, and how that feeds back from a metrics pipeline. I don't know if you've seen any hints of that kind of thinking in this, Greg, or you know, if we're thinking about that. Well, for somebody that invents the concept of chaos monkeys, I'm sure they've got those kind of things. I just haven't seen the whole picture. They've got a giant architectural diagram about this whole project that I'm only scratching the surface of. Yeah, because I'd very much like to bring canary deployments you know, to CF, and I, I'm not sure exactly the right way of doing it, if it's us or if it's a meta thing or how, how we would accept that kind of request. Hey, hey Roy, what are you up to? We, had, you, we haven't had you on before. You want to introduce yourself? Sure, um, Roy Clarkson. I'm also on the Spring team. Uh, I heard Greg was going to come on here and present something. So I thought I would lurk around. <clears throat> I've been traveling all day, so I'm pretty wiped out at the moment. Um, Where are you at? <laughs> What's that? Where are you at? I'm in San Francisco now. <laughs> He's in the same hotel with me on a different floor. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah, so I'll be, I'll I be hear. In the office all week. I hear this rumor that you and Stein and a couple others are working on this awesome patterns, group of patterns for folks to help them understand how to make cloud native applications. We are indeed, yes. Um, so are, are, I, I can ask Stein, are, are we uh, prepared to announce that kind of stuff right now? 
This is after dark. We can talk about anything after dark. Eight people watch after dark. <laughs> Bill, all of our secrets here because that's if, right. If they don't have enough life that they're doing something else Sunday night, they want to hear about Cloud Foundry and Spring together. Then we just tell them everything. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, so uh, we we had an idea that uh, the Spring IO website is open source and. It's already hosting a bunch of getting started guides, which Greg has talked about a few times. Um, so we decided to basically fork that website, and we're going to be producing some similar content around uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry and, and uh, some of the services that might be showing up in the future. <laughs> um, so we're, we're excited about uh, creating some content so that it really makes it easier for people to, to get started working on some new projects and, and enable them to more easily uh, use the services that are available there. I, I think it's huge to start getting serious about like cloud native application design or having opinions about that. I mean, Matt, you're doing a, a big training at uh, the O'Reilly Conference, the O'Reilly Architecture Conference. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I've got a couple of things coming up um, related to that. So one is uh, you put Wu Tang. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> Wu Tang on your. I'm just keeping it real. <laughs> <laughs> Anything well, goes on after dark. Why, why you gotta Why you gotta hate, James? I'm not hating. I'm loving it. Actually, I love it. All right, that's great. I didn't have any good Warren G stuff tonight, sorry. We needed some intro music for this. <laughs> intro music. We'll do some outro music later. How about that? Perfect. Back to back to O'Reilly. Back to your regular scheduled architecture conference. Um, yeah, so I got two things coming. I wrote a little uh, I wrote a little mini book called Migrating to Cloud Native App Architectures that um, O'Reilly's going to publish and distribute at the conference, and is also going to be made available as a free ebook. And um, basically, takes you through the why all this cloud native stuff's happening and what it looks like, and then where the enterprise is and where it needs to go to get kind of into a cloud native way of thinking. And then kind of ends with this book of uh, cookbook of recipes around. Migrating monolithic apps to more cloud native apps, and then a lot of the distributed patterns that we're working on on our team, stuff that's going into this reference architecture side around things like service discovery and fault tolerance. And uh, so that's all there. And then I'm also doing a two day training around Cloud Foundry and Spring, and, and specifically Spring Cloud and the wrappers and things that we've done around a lot of the Netflix open source services for kind of gluing microservice architectures together. And it's going to be a you know, two-day intensive, all-day training. We've got uh, basically four 90-minute sessions each day. I'll probably talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then I'll have labs. I've got 26 hands-on labs that people are going to get to go through. Wow. And by the end of this, you will have a microservice architecture with like four different services glued together with all the Netflix services and uh, OAuth security and all that goodness uh, running on P-dubs. And uh, at least that's the goal if, uh, if you make it through all of the labs. And uh, we're going to take that out for a spin and eventually hope to turn that into uh, an offering that we do through Pivotal you know, with our customers that are looking to get trained up on this. So this will be kind of like the first time out with that. It's intense out there. That's why I really appreciate you and Roy and the whole Spring team helping on these Cloud Patterns apps because I get pulled into uh, legacy enterprise service bus versus cloud native design holy wars at the CIO levels right now because you get some groups that are like, hey, let's move forward and then other groups are really used to asking the ESB to do a lot of work and, you know, come what performance and complexity may. So I know we won't answer all of that in one shot, but that is a hot conversation right now on our install base. I don't know if you're feeling it too, Matt. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that it's a hot conversation means that we're actually getting some good momentum in the direction that we want. You go back, a, you know, a year, year and a half ago, 
And, and it wasn't a question of this versus this. It was, hey, how are you going to run my ESB on your Cloud Foundry thing? So we, we've, hit, we've moved the conversation to, oh, there might actually be a decision point here. And it's going to be a it's going to be a slow process of you know most of our you know pe people that are moving to Cloud Foundry and moving to these architectures they're not going to do this overnight right we're going to have years probably of you know intermediate state between the old and the new and we've got a lot of enabling to do around making. I mean, for I think two things. One is that this kind of pattern work is critical to seeing adoption and to actually see yeah. uh, app instances move into production on Cloud Foundry. This one thing to talk about Cloud Native and platform and you know the bright new future. But if you can't get the average developer in these organizations to understand those architectures and take advantage of them, uh, then then it's never going to happen. Yep. And yep. Speaking of patterns, Matt, you want to talk a little bit about what we've got coming in the next couple of months, too? Yeah, so what, uh, what Roy and, uh, and Craig Walls have been working on is taking that spring.io site, codenamed Sagan, which we have now forked into another project, codenamed Cosmos, so we stuck with the Carl Sagan theme, and um, basically you're going to have three different sets of content in there. You're going to have the getting started guides like what we've been mentioned a couple times which is taking you know a pattern or a slice of a pattern and getting sort of the hello world version of that up and running using all of our tech. Um, so you'll have that content there. Uh, rolling up from that you'll have a set of content around the patterns themselves. So we support service discovery. You want to learn, okay, what service discovery? How does that work? So we're going to have content around that. You want to learn about fault tolerance, about circuit breakers. What are those? Why do you want to use them? How are they supposed to work? So we'll have that content. And then rolling up from that, um, we have these documents that we're calling reference documents, which is much bigger areas that kind of group patterns together. So like, for example, just the idea of microservices and how that plays into a lot of these patterns would be a document. And then you'll have something around, say, um, data consistency um, and what that means across applications in the cloud. Um, scaling, auto-scaling, topics like that. You know, how you, how you handle um, scaling decisions. What does it look like to scale on demand versus auto-scaling? What are the gotchas that you run into? What do you have to think about with your state? All of these things, rolling those up into these bigger pieces of content. So if you consume at any level, you'll also have links out into the content that's related to it. So you're reading something about fault tolerance. So yeah, I want to go try that. You'll have a link out to the guide that shows you how to go do that. And so the idea is to have sort of whenever we have questions around how I make decisions about my architecture or even how down to I code it, that we can say, oh, just go to this site. All of our content around exactly what you're trying to do is organized in this one place. And that'll be stretching across Cloud Foundry, across the data services, across Spring, across everything eventually. Here's my only prediction on this. I think it's going to be amazing. I think we're the only company that has the framework know-how, the app pattern know-how, and the platform know-how to pull this off. And I think there's going to be uh, Matt, uh, Roy and Craig certified developers for cloud native apps in the enterprise. I make that prediction one year from now there will be a certification based on this and it will be coveted. I want to apply for Matt Roy Craig certification status. Well Greg I think we could get you on the approval board too. I'm just trying to say <laughs> on the patterns. You will be Wu-Tang certified. The, the question is if you can be Mark Pollock certified. Now that would be Oh yeah, that would be the moon. We we all that's, aspire to that. Yeah. That's certified or certifiable? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, oh, I think James Bear had to drop. I was, he's going to come back in a bit. I have some cool stuff to to do a little sneak preview on. Uh, so, Ripka, Andrew, you've been kind of quiet. You're out there on the on the front lines of this little thing. You have anything you want to say about what you're doing or how? Uh, Cloud Foundry fits into your life. 
Well, I mean, I think a lot of stuff that Matt's doing and, and talking about um, is really, really powerful because, like James says, every day I'm out there and I'm talking to somebody who's got some horrible monolith that they've made mistakes in over 20 years, and, you know, it's time to get this thing, you know, help me migrate this onto your platform. And, you know, we, I have a lot of conversations with people about, you know, what I'm calling now uh, uh, when you have a legacy app, what you need is an API surface that you can use to modernize. And that's the perfect thing to build in Cloud Foundry as a small set of microservices that talk to your legacy backend architecture. And so that, that's a, a new kind of a, a play I'm starting to, to roll out. I, I'm going to brag about Ripka for a second. We've been, uh, we've been having some of the field engineers uh, just come through and code a little bit with the engineers, and we have this... Uh, a programming interview, and Rip goes all nervous, and he got, like, within two points of perfect, so there's not a lot of field engineers that are also ace programmers just hanging out out in the field helping customers understand things. That was pretty cool. So that's my brag about Ripka moment. So when I, when I asked you that question a minute ago, I didn't mean for you to tie it back into what Stein was doing. I just wanted you to, to kind of riff off the Cloud Foundry world and what you see, not necessarily limited to this microservices Oh, yeah, and I see, you know, I see a, a lot of companies that, um, you know, some of the things that Greg's talking about working on, I'm talking to a lot of companies who, you know, they look at Cloud Foundry and, and what James calls the God complex, uh, I like that, you know, they're looking for a cloud management platform and they see, you know, Cloud Foundry's lack of these things or a lack of a recommendation on these things as being a gap in the product right now. And, you know, I, I, I like to point back to something that James Bear said at the Cloud Platform Conference last June is we got to get one data center really, really good, and I think we're getting close to that now before we start worrying about how we do workload bursting across multiple data centers or multiple clouds. Yeah, I think our discipline there is going to be rewarded because you can put flimsy abstractions over brittle things and, you know, you have predictable results, but if you build good foundations, it becomes much easier to build abstractions after you do that, so I hope that's the case for us. Hey, Barry, you're back. What do you got for us this week? Hey, how's it going, guys? Um, well, I thought I'd give you a little demo. Um, see if I can fire this up. Um, we've been working on uh, Diego for quite a long time. People have, have heard about it a lot, and I think people actually want to start seeing it. Um, we were uh, super, super close to uh, getting it into prod last uh, last Thursday or Friday. Um, but, uh, oh, James, you're just covering your face here, huh? I can't uh, handle let it. Let me see. Let me see one thing I can do here. How about that? Um, oh, look, it's X-Ray. Yeah. So uh, we, we didn't quite get it la at the end of last week, but uh, Diego should be in production um, uh, next, uh, next week, this coming week, if all goes well. And what, what you're seeing is actually our integration environment here where we actually have Diego running in a, in a Cloud Foundry instance, and you're seeing all the containers uh, that Diego is managing for applications. Um, so we, we have four different uh, virtual machines uh, deployed in two different availability zones. So this first row represents uh, one cell, which is uh, the, the kind of the new name for what was called the DEA in the current architecture uh, with the Ruby runtime. So when we move over to Diego, we'll use a new terminology called cells. And so these are all the containers running in the in the first cell in zone one, and these are all the containers running in the second cell. And then you go down to the um, AZ2. And it looks a little unbalanced right now, and that's because we aggressively uh, do deployments on this environment. And so what happens is um, so this, this first uh, VM is always the one that gets rolled first. And so while we're rolling the other VMs, uh, it's the first one to become available. That's, so that's where all the, the containers land. So... Um, that's why it looks a little unbalanced, um, but we, we do have plans to, to work on, on that eventually. Uh, but, you know, this is a visualization of, of Diego, and so right here I can just, you know, type things in. Um, I know some of the, the things are called Grace, for example, one of the sample applications, and, um, you know, I can launch the the app from there and, and just visually see it. I can uh, show the how things are distributed via number of containers or how much memory each one is taking up or how much disk. Uh, right now we, we give everyone a fixed amount of disk, so memory you see things vary a little bit, um, and the containers are just, you know, everything's the same unit there. 
Um, but if I go ahead and scale this out in real time, so I'm going to go scale this, uh, let's see if I can scale this to uh, 15. And up in the background here, um, we should see a, a bunch more containers just get spun up right there. There you go. Right? Yeah, Grace is pink. Yep. So when I hover, when I sit over that, all the other ones fade out, and you can see the ones that just uh, fired up. Um, so it's it's incredibly responsive, and uh, if I go you know scale it back down again, um, let's go you know, kill those those five that I just created. Um, they're immediately uh, reflected as gone. Um, so yeah, we're we're really excited about this. We want to want to visualize what's going on, Diego. Give people a, a better sense of of what's going on. And so this is a the, the engineers working on this are really sharp. They 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 built this uh, using uh, React JS. And uh, they've done the, all this uh, in, in about two weeks because the uh, Rust API for Diego is, is pretty uh, pretty clean. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what comes. But uh, we're really excited to get Diego in production. Um, and this this example, this uh, Grace James image is actually I pushed CF pushed it as a Docker image. Um, so it, this is not only showcasing running normal Cloud Foundry applications with build packs. Um, you'd also be able to reference a Docker image. As an application source, instead of uh, providing all of that, um, so that just kind of you know changes changes the uh, the level of responsibility, right? I'm I'm taking full accountability for everything inside the container when I push this Docker image, whereas when I push with the build pack, I'm just saying, well, here's my WAR file or whatever other application source code, and I let the build pack package up the rest of it for me. Both of those modes will be supported uh, when Diego goes live. And then I think this is a good. You know, this will be a tool that we're going to include for free with uh, something we're calling Lattice. Do you want to tell people a little bit about the plans for Lattice and what's coming over the next month there? Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, give you a little preview. Um, we've been uh, working on making Diego more accessible than uh, than starting with a full Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, we're dropping all the secrets tonight. Andrew's giving me the eye raise. He's like, bro, I had planned to release that as a website. It's going to be <laughs> fine. This is fine. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's uh, we'll we'll leave a couple we'll leave a little bit of it bottled up, but I'll just I'll just say we're we're putting together um, making Diego extremely accessible technology so that you can stand it up with a Vagrant VM. Um, you don't have to know any anything else about uh, Cloud Foundry t in order to use it. You can just basically Vagrant up and get your your VM on your on your local machine. Or you can uh, do a similar experience using Terraform on uh, at least three different uh, public clouds. We're going to start off with uh, at least AWS and, and Google and uh, DigitalOcean. And so you, you may not know um, anything about uh, Cloud Foundry and you want to just kind of kick the tires. You don't have to learn Bosch to use it. You can basically just you know, r run a couple of deployment scripts uh, with your cloud credentials or your, on your local laptop and you can be scheduling containers and just like right now this grace example I'm gonna I'm gonna click it and you see index 9 and I re refresh it and I'm we're using a, a load balancing built right into the platform and I get um, a DNS name right there already built in um, if I were to, to uh, show you the logs for this uh, I can actually go do that right now logs um, grace um, what you're gonna see is when I start uh, refreshing this that all the logs um, will start coming in um, as, I, as I'm hitting it there. And so, so these aggregated logs across all of your containers, the load balancing um, in front of your containers um, is just built into this uh, simple user experience that, that we have. And plus, uh, the, yeah. plus the health checking. Yeah, you got automatic health checking with that. You can specify um, your own health custom health checks. Um, we do a very basic one. Um, if you don't provide one, we'll just uh, check the uh, the port that your application is listing on. And not only you know, we, we watch your PID, we always do that, but in addition to watching your PID, let's say you have a bunch of threads deadlocked and you can't process any requests. If if uh, if, if we have the port check open, we'll detect that and um, um, basically uh, re re mark that application instance as unhealthy. So all that's coming up. Uh, we, we hope to get that launched uh, by the end of the month or so, um, and it's really good timing because Diego's can, will be considered uh, at least beta in production with real Cloud Foundry deployments uh, running in uh, our, our Pivotal Web Services, our hosted edition. So that means we have the confidence to put it in our production environment along with uh, running alongside our existing code base. And, uh, yeah, we're just really excited to have everyone get their hands on it. So the, the project you're talking about is sort of um, a single tenant Cloud Foundry. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little bit more um, 
uh, like uh, ha being cluster root of of a bunch of hosts that can run your containers. Um, you know, Cloud Foundry has a, a bunch of team management built in, so you can have separate organizations and then separate within an organization things like dev, staging, test. Um, Cloud, Cloud Foundry proper has a bunch of stuff that makes sense if you're trying to manage hundreds of engineers. That's right. Yeah, this is this is more about um, hey, I I trust everyone I'm working with. We're all going to share the same credentials. Um, we're going to be cluster root, and um, and we're going to go to town. You still get everything running in a in a container, and you can put limits on the containers. Um, but you actually, with this technology that we're going to make available um, with with Diego, this easy to get started thing, um, we'll let you run as run as root um, inside Diego um, containers if you want to. Um, three, so three that's people, a, uh, three people in a dorm room style. Yeah, yeah, that's not something we, we'd we'd allow in a large public multi-tenant instance, for example. And how um, much overhead is this system imposing? You know, so how much does running, you know, Lattice Diego impose? I mean, it's it's pretty thin when I saw. It. The, the memory footprint that when I looked at it the one time you were running it, James. Yeah, it's 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 really great. Like the process overhead on inside the virtual machine that you spin up on your laptop with no containers is about 256 megs of memory, um, and so that that doesn't count you know the the VM itself. Yeah. Um, but uh, just the process overhead for for the Diego, the router, and the log servers um, are only 256 megs. So once you put traffic and containers through there, you, you know it goes up. Um, when you run it in a scaled up mode, when you're running on, on uh, let's say, Amazon or Google or DigitalOcean, each one of the, um, what we call um, the, the cells um, that, that can run uh, Diego containers, that's how you scale out the number of containers you can run, it's only somewhere around 150 megs of process overhead in those things. So you know, you're getting a, a huge amount of efficiency um, when you're running a lot of containers inside of every uh, virtual instance. Just, just be careful to have good container hygiene in your images, because otherwise you fill up the disk. Bring, bring, bring your own hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'd be curious to get Greg and Roy, like, you think this is going to help people build, you know, mock-up distributed applications in a way that it would have been harder for them to do before? I, I think it could, but I'd love your honest take on if this could be useful to, a, you know, a, a developer. Well, this looks like the kind of thing that would blast Micro Cloud Foundry out of the water. I used that when I did a presentation uh, down in Atlanta at the Spring User Group when uh, when Roy lived down in Atlanta, and uh, I I was talking about some uh, distributed app stuff, and I, I happened to have one of those old thumb drives with Micro Cloud Foundry, and I I missed it when it got left behind in the uh, major upgrade. So this looks really exciting to me. <clears throat> yeah, it's a turn on that thinking. I mean, I think. We, we realized that it might have been a lot to ask someone to run every component of Cloud Foundry. Like, for instance, when you're a single developer running the UAA as an identity service on your laptop, that didn't make a ton of sense to me in the minimal use case. So maybe in a full production mock use case, it still makes sense. But we're, we're excited about all the places this very low pro, very thin layer can go. Um, and the other thing is that you know, we now advertise the IP address of the host to the app. So Matt's been able to include like Eureka service discovery can work out of the box here. So you don't. I, have to use the I think from I think what I'm excited about the most is uh, the experiments that will enable that will eventually migrate into Cloud Foundry. But being able to do that service discovery experiment, being able to do you know a bunch of other kind of low hanging fruit type of things that you never want to do with a system people are running in production is going to be a big win. Yep, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, Diego has another couple of other things that we didn't really have in, in normal uh, in the previous existing, I guess, you know, V2 uh, DEAs. That you'll, you're able to run as schedule asynchronous tasks um, as applications and uh, basically run those as something that you know runs runs once and then stops. Whereas you know today, Cloud Foundry apps expect you to be running them forever, and then if one of your instances dies because it's uh, say, hey, I'm done, I exit zero just like I expect. Cloud Foundry says, "Hey, that's you're supposed to be running," and starts you up another one. So Diego kind of addresses that and lets you run asynchronous tasks and let them um, exit cleanly. Keeps track of all those things. So that's another uh, capability. And these primitives, um, you'll be able to, to build some interesting things on them. Um, uh, one one of the ones maybe we'll t talk about uh, in a future after dark is uh, Concourse, um, a little CI system that some of the uh, some of the Cloud Foundry engineers have experimented with and. They've done some neat things by uh, by using some of these Diego primitives um, to to not only uh, run their apps but also do some of the build processes and things like that. 
So Nima jumped in. You got something to say, Nima? No. Long time listener, first time caller, the usual. <laughs> Nima is responsible for bringing CloudBees uh, Enterprise Jenkins to the platform, as well as an upcoming Cassandra service that we're working on with DataStax. He owns the relation technical relationship with those companies, just so people know who Nima is. He's uh, doing great things for the ecosystem. Thanks, James. So we've been on for about an hour. Do we have any good secrets? Or do we already tell enough secrets? <laughs> this, this is why people come, James. I hope they come for more than that. No. I got a lot of emails last week after I talked about the IaaS is free. That really stirred up a lot of curiosity and interest. And uh, just to be clear, that will be coming more detail on that in March. Um, but what we mean is uh, that access to our publicly hosted Pivotal Web Services, which is a multi-tenant uh, service, will be part of our software subscription for free. So if you uh, are a subscriber to our software and you want to run the, your app on our hosted edition and get enterprise support, uh, you can choose that for free, etc. I think the other thing that we should probably so that just to be clear, this that's free when you run on our our instance of it. It's not like we go and buy you a cloud uh, of your own. Uh, we give you access to the one that we run. Um, and James, you might want to give an update on Pivotal CF and uh, 1.4 that's coming out, and the fact that it's now got Amazon out of the box GUI installer support, right? Yeah. If you if you, any of you follow Matt Ryder, um, he's been uh, happily tweeting the progress of that as as it's. Uh, it's getting very close to release now. And uh, the same experience that we have on, on vSphere and vCloud, um, we, we have on Amazon Web Services. And uh, OpenStack is, is only going to be about a month or so behind when we release uh, the AWS version. So uh, you get a uniform operations experience across these different clouds. Um, whether you're on vSphere or AWS or OpenStack, it'll look and feel the same when you're operating uh, Cloud Foundry installing it. There's a couple of nuances where we will, uh, you know, allow you to. We have some IaaS specific things. Let's say if I want to tie into S3 or to Swift, or to something like that. Um, but for the most part, uh, the the vast majority of the the configuration and deployment is is the same experience across the clouds. I think that's pretty exciting. And so just so people know. You know, we do charge for our stuff for enterprises, but if you go to Pivotal Network and you download it, there's no keys on the software. So if developers want to go out and just try to, you know, build their own Cloud Foundry with Pivotal CF on Amazon, no one's going to call you up and nag you. Um, so the software is all out there to download, and it comes with a 90-day trial legally on it. So I hope that it really opens up more experimentation for people that want to try Amazon with a more professional installer, uh, it's just going to be right there for the for the taking. Yeah, yeah. Let me be clear. The user experience is, is pretty nice, right? You're going to um, set up a, a couple of Amazon artifacts that like in, in, you know share share some uh, configuration information to point us to your account on Amazon. But within your virtual private cloud, your VPC and Amazon, we're going to set up the infrastructure that that you need and, and deploy all the the Amazon instances and configure them and and have them talk to each other. So a lot of the kind of the pain and the, um, the, the high hurdle that you have to jump over to get a, a large um, multi-tenant instance of Cloud Foundry spanning many VMs together is, is simplified drastically. Um, so, you know, after, you know, it might, might take, uh, we're still experimenting with some of the install times. Um, it takes somewhere between an hour to two hours um, to, to do all the, the, the setup. But, like, after that experience, you know, without a lot of intervention on your part, you have a full working Cloud Foundry that you can scale out um, very large. Just, just uh, has anyone done the napkin calculation of what that minimal install would cost per month on Amazon? Yeah, it's 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 um, right now we haven't optimized to for co-locating a lot of the virtual machines, so we we have a scale out architecture. Mac um, is the design goal, um, so it's a. Uh, it's it's not going to be super cheap, you know, because you're running somewhere around 30 to 40 instances of varying size. You do get to pick the sizes, um, so we auto pick um, the smallest uh, or the most appropriate Amazon instance for you. Um, but if you uh, if if you're running a lot of VMs, it's it's um, it's you know it's going to add up because you're running tens of Amazon instances all the time. 
Yeah, I mean, and the early users of this are things like the GE, you know, uh, build out, you know, Philips Health Data Platform, and a lot of these big mega industrials that are building very big apps and doing very big use cases. So we've got that high availability scale out install by default. Um, and that's why I'm also interested in the lattice stuff, which takes it the whole way down to, well, do you have 256 megabytes of overhead, then you can run something that's spiritually similar to Cloud Foundry. It really just depends on how heavyweight you want to go. I mean, it's the same exact internal guts for the scheduler and the rest of those components. It just doesn't have the, the authentication and the rest of the spaces and work stuff. Yeah, and Bosch. And well, of course. All the build packs. Bosch is this little implementation detail to get stuff out there, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, one of my favorite stories still is to talk about um, what happens, like, when these security vulnerabilities come out. So, like, when uh, the ghost vulnerability came out, um, our, our team at, um, you know, in the factory, we turned the crank on the software. We spit out a, um, a new, new release that uh, has the patch in it. You download the file from Pivotal Network, um, or the open source Cloud Foundry if you're going that route and just using Bosch um, on, your, on your own. But uh, it will automatically deploy all of the, um, the new virtual machines with, with the patch in them, um, keeping things uh, up and running for your applications if you have enough capacity. So we'll incrementally roll out the VMs. And uh, your developers, that um, unless they've statically included something that uh, used um, the glibc, the, the, the wrong version, they don't have to do anything to their apps. They just get it for, for, for free. They, they pick up the update when the operator rolls it out. And the operator doesn't have to do a lot of fancy coordination either because we deploy these things in multiple availability zones and we roll them one at a time and then do a canary deploy for the rest of it, uh, max VMs in flight of, let's say, one or two. So we just incrementally roll through your deployment and the ghost vulnerability is patched in about an hour or two. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the hour, but I have a question about that. The way that this works, when you do that rollout, is it moving the containers um, between the VMs? And then, yeah. and then you're, you're kind of on, it's on you as the app um, or operators to have ar architected that so that you have, you know, whatever, like high availability so it can lose an instance, right? And then yeah. be able to roll without any downtime. Yeah, so what we do is we, we have uh, um, the, the concept of availability zone, so we'll run the, 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 the role that's called the DEA in the current architecture of the cell in the new architecture. Um, we recommend that you have um, at least several of those in each availability zone. And then for when you're running an app, we recommend that you run at least two copies of your app um, so that when we, we drain one of the virtual machines that's running containers, um, while we're draining that out, um, that you want the, at least one copy of your app up and running. Diego just implemented this really cool feature where they will actually wait until your container is started and, and able to receive traffic on the other um, VM before they take down your original instance. So theoretically with Diego, um, for the, at least the drain scenario, you could only have one. But you really don't want that because that means you can't tolerate a failure until um, the system recovers your instance. So we still recommend at least two. Um, but there's this kind of sophisticated uh, draining approach where we, when we send a shutdown signal to the VM, we give everyone um, a grace period to get out of that VM and bring uh, up those containers on other VMs before we shut them down. So I flashed a tweet out there. I don't know if people saw it. You, you see this one, Andrew? Just now? or no? Tell me if you see this now. It was really popular today. Oh, sorry, never mind. I lost it. I'll show it to you right now. Uh, I was just something I said offhand, and then you know, like one of the lead writers for the Economist tweeted it, and a lot of people. Gartner picked it up. Can you see it now? Yes. Um, and this is why I think our Amazon service is so timely and important. And we've always been able to install Cloud Foundry at Amazon, but now we've got this very, very sanded down enterprise install experience, even on Amazon, just, just add water, no command line. And uh, I've just, this is just an honest sentiment that we've just seen a lot of people go from thinking of Amazon as a commodity infrastructure supplier. I think that mem is just dead in the market right now. And I think everyone that I talk to understands that the more they build into the Amazon specific platform services, the Amazon conventions around um, 
you know, managing uh, user metadata and ELBs and everything else that they're locking themselves into and training their people really on an idiosyncratic way of orchestration. So um, this one really took off virally on a lazy Sunday afternoon today, and I think it, it echoes the importance of what we're up to with our multi-cloud installer. So I'm pretty pumped about it. So that's uh, an hour and five minutes. Are you bored? No, man. I've got work to do. Are you bored? I've got work to do, too. i got a job now. You haven't bragged about your new website yet, and you should stir a little – you should kick a little dust around the uh, app container image uh, getting into the other uh, container management uh, community. You should. I would love to hear some shake, some clay comments late in the hour on that. Late in the hour, so we did they make a new website. From late in the game. There, there is a new website for uh, Cloud Foundry at Pivotal. Actually, Thank there's a, there's a whole new website for all of Pivotal, so it's not Cloud Foundry specific, but and you and the marketing team knocked that out. It was awesome. Definitely an upgrade from the uh, the old version of the website, and I, I'm not the one that said that. So, anyone who wants to say. Are you soliciting feedback on uh, what people think of the website, Andrew? Where should Actually, they I don't care what you think. <laughs> it's an amazing upgrade. A lot of people put a lot of effort into, and I think it looks great. And it will continue to iterate and add more content and be fleshed out as time permits. It's still not perfect. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, I, I want to get some more developer love into it. I think it's it's pretty fantastic for operators, though. It's it's for those line of business guys, James. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then you wanted to talk about the uh, pull requests, or what are you talking about? No, it's, just, it's just really fascinating to watch the evolution of these two VC-backed container companies. The slap fight on GitHub? It's just every day. Um, it's free entertainment. Like, I never want for television or anything, right? Like, it's just... Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. And the reason it matters to me is I, I think that we should absolutely, and I'm writing checks right now that we haven't you know engineered in yet, but the app container spec, I don't know what you think, James Bear, I mean, it's ultimately kind of your call, but I think it's pretty important to us to support that in things like Lattice and Diego. Yeah, I mean, let's be clear with what we're talking about because I think we're kind of like almost uh, subtweeting. Um, <laughs> we're, we're talking about, uh, I think it was on Friday, um, CoreOS uh, announced that uh, they ha they wrote a blog post and they sh they sent a pull request uh, for an actual working implementation of uh, the the app container specification um, into Docker, as well as showed that Rocket can run Docker images. So it's kind of like a bi-directional thing. They also sent a proposal um, to to Docker um, to uh, work on uh, a more um, common um, Container format, an image format that the that, uh, that you know, the CoreOS guys um, and gals definitely believe that uh, there are some some improvements that should be made to the to the Docker container image. So that's what we're talking about. Like if you go look at the pull request on GitHub, there's a lot of uh, constructive and some not so constructive comments. If you go read about it on Hacker News, there's a lot about there. Um, so back to what I think about it um, personally, as um, you know. I really like the elegance of the, the app container image format up for how you do retrieval of images and how you can verify that those images were um, signed and potentially encrypted by someone. They, they, one of their design principles is they want you to be able to use standard web technologies, so they use things like GPG and curl and wget to pull the images down. There's no magic um, black box registry that you don't understand the workings of if you don't want it to be. And the other thing that's, that's really cool is you can use technologies like BitTorrent to distribute these things um, in a very complicated environment. So that example earlier where we were talking about Netflix, um, when you, if, you if you have a new container that has, let's say, a gig or two gigs worth of stuff in it, and you're going to distribute that to uh, a thousand machines at the same time, something like BitTorrent would really be an effective way to, to distribute that as opposed to uh, having all those machines you know, pull down two gigs from one host at the same time. So... Um, those are the kinds of things that that uh, that I'm excited about. So um, you know, we'll see. Maybe the maybe the Docker and CoreOS uh, communities kind of sort this out, and they they find ways to make the uh, the, the things work together. Um, but either way, there's just a lot of enthusiasm about this container specification. Whether um, it, the, I I know I can tell you 100% for sure 
that the the stuff that's going on with CoreOS and Rocket has accelerated the Docker's um, investment into defining more rigorously their pluggability and their container image format because before it was very the the standard was kind of black box ish and it was like well the the specification is what Docker does and now it's actually something that you can go review in a markdown format and um, see exactly how they're laying out the files, um, the metadata, and the layers. So it's, it's much better. It's, it's no longer academic to us now that we have Lattice and Diego, right? Like, we, like on the, the PWS starting to have next week, Diego running, you can upload a Docker-based or, you know, potentially in the future app container spec-based app um, live, and so we'll need to figure out who to partner with to, you know, have access to a registry in the yeah. next and the, the, the registry is a huge deal because if you don't have a stable registry or a stable way to pull these things down, you you, you can probably go see the Docker status handle on Twitter. Um, you know, they, they the Docker Hub it gets a lot of traffic and it's it's new technology, so sometimes it's not available, and so you don't necessarily want to put that thing in the middle of your production deployment system and have, take an external dependency on that if you don't have to. And certainly some of our um, install, installations run in an air gapped environment where they would never do that. Take a a, de a dependency of something on the internet that could change from underneath of you. So, yeah, so, we, we definitely. I was going to know that you know the details matter. Obviously, it's a game of details. But when you can look at things like the fact that System D can pull these images in now, it's trivial. Not not necessarily trivial, but it hasn't been that much work for uh, uh, the patch to make Docker run Rocket images. The fact that Warden runs Docker images like this. Tech is not really that uh, sophisticated. I mean, all you're doing is talking about a, a file system and then some process control with the features in the kernel, and anyone can do that. And I think it's exciting to see everyone excited about that, but I think it's also um, a little bit misguided where people are just like, oh, like, we have this new technology, we invent this new technology, and really it's the way that Google's been running everything for a while. LXC gave you this power before. What, what really happened is it became accessible and it became a, a part of everyone's consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see who we pick to... I mean, part of the, the real talk here is, is that uh, Docker Inc. has so far said that, you know, if you're not uh, official, if you're not running every bit that they make on the agent and everything else, that they're not really that interested in having their registry hook up to your services. And so I think that's why this becomes a political thing is that ultimately we need to provide users choice of how they get images, container images into the system. Um, and things like Quay that follow a more open specification that don't have as much kind of VC pressure behind them to be monopolies way too early in their evolution, I think could be much more interesting to our users. Um, uh, than maybe the preemptively closed um, and, uh, and, you know, not ecosystem-focused anymore uh, Docker Inc. So. Well, this may or may not be interesting to our users, but I think it is, and I think it's interesting to me. I really want to get to the point where we, just like we've extracted these pieces into Lattice to standalone, I want to be able to have the state here standalone so you can eject the containers that we're creating and, and then make them Docker, or make them Rocket, or make them whatever um, whatever you want them to be. So the, I mean, right now you, you have the build pack process and you get a container, it runs in our system, and everything's great, but you can't eject that. You can't pull that out, and I think that would be a great feature. Um, and I think that would, that would foster a lot of uh, innovation around all this stuff if there's a really nice standard, almost like you know, Packer or whatever for VMs or for containers to be uh, any image format, any any of these runtime formats, just back and forth with a with a nice uh, API. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's really what I think the app container image is, is all about: is trying to, to be a collaborative way that's just a piece of it. Is a you know their philosophy is much more, uh, and they talk about this uh, Unix philosophy, like develop a tool, have it do one thing, do it really well, and then chain them together, and you can mix and match things. Um, and and Docker is kind of coming at things from a from a different point of view. That's a lot more. It's a little bit more monolithic, but they want the the people that are in the Docker ecosystem have this very highly curated experience. So they they introduce um, kind of a, a curated um, opinions that uh, that you're kind of 
um, they want you to, to be in that experience and that they're not as open to, to plugging that. Now, they're, they're, they're getting pressure from the community to add more extension points and make it more pluggable. So, so they have opinions about certain things, but they don't have opinions about other things. And the reality is, if you want to run uh, a sophisticated uh, platform, not, not just Cloud Foundry, but whatever you're going to build on, if you want to run Docker in production and you have hundreds of developers working on this, then the build pipeline and the way that you're going to do things to deploy your code, it's going to start to look suspiciously like build packs. So taking advantage of some of these build pipelines and be able to create these Docker images with something that's standardized, um, build packs or otherwise, I think that will, be, that will help uh, move things forward by allowing people to focus on where they differentiate instead of like how they're going to set up their build pipeline. Yeah, and I think that gets to where we have room to improve, which is you know, uh, you know, modularity in terms of consuming smaller bits of CF as an individual and still getting value out of them without it being completely integrated. I think we've more than demonstrated incredible values, and in when we're all integrated and you know are, you know, un, un, unmatched growth in large enterprises. But I, I do think we have to keep a conscience of being useful to individuals and smaller pieces as well to to keep ourselves grounded. So with that, unless I someone knew had, I knew we had one more big one there to talk about. <laughs> I, I, we had to cover that one. I, we got it out there. We got it out. Minima, this is just note to self. We need to we need to go pick a partner for our uh, container registry. Top of mind to me would be our friends at Google and maybe our friends at CoreOS with Quay. I don't know what other people think about the container registry service. Why do we just have to have one? I'm just thinking out loud. We'll get out of here. Hey, we're Switzerland. We're in the middle. Exactly. We, we, I think it, I, it, you know, just watching this whole thing evolve, it's like us before we had pluggable build packs, when we had proprietary stager pipelines, we're like, no, we don't want to be pluggable. We'll tell you everything about the experience. And we kind of went through that evolution, too. So we'll see how this whole market shakes out. Any Sounds aha good? moments, or should we just close it down, everyone get back to work? It's a, it's a holiday tomorrow, so we could go for another hour, right? <laughs> Let's just ship this and call it good. Call it good? It's live, man. This is continuous delivery. <laughs> it doesn't matter how late I stay open or how late I stay up. My kids still get me up at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Thanks for coming on, Greg, and thanks for the cool update. Oh, sure. My so pleasure. With that, I think we'll call it. Uh, thanks for, for watching, and uh, we'll do it again next week. Hopefully we can get Sam. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye.